This week on the Pro Wrestling Podcast, podcast. Tammy Sitch, the former WWE diva Sonny, has been sentenced to 17 years in prison. Is Warner Brothers Discovery looking to replace AEW with Monday Night Raw? Matt and Jeff Hardy both voiced their frustrations with the AEW creative. And the whole entire wrestling world reacts to CM Punk. I'm your host, Seth Grimes, and this is the Pro Wrestling Podcast Podcast. What the fuck is up, everybody? Welcome. Come on in to another episode of the Pro Wrestling Podcast Podcast. I am your boy, Seth Grimes, here on episode 95. And look, guys, I got big, big news. We have hit the goal. 1,000 subscribers. Your boy has passed that milestone. Your boy is now officially monetized on YouTube. Can you believe it? All the time I've spent on here bugging you guys, mentioning, hey, we're on our way to 1,000. We are on our way to 1,000. Well, check it out, guys. We have reached our goal. I have reached 1,000 subscribers. If you listening now are one of those people who have subscribed to me on YouTube and helped me reach that milestone, Thank you so goddamn much from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate you so much. If you have not yet subscribed, what you doing? Hit that subscribe button down below. You can still hop on and hang out with us as I try to bust out content as often as I can for you guys. I love it. I love doing it, and I'm going to do it for years and years to come. 1,000 is just the start. That's the starting point for me. That's where you're eligible for monetization. Once you're monetized, you hit the ground running, you know, to making a living off of this shit, which is exactly what I'm looking to do. So I appreciate you guys for all of your support, hanging out with me. And here we are, episode 95, now on our way to episode 100. But enough about me and all of my bullshit. You hit the subscribe You did all of that, so we're just going to go ahead and hop right into our first topic here today. Well, ever since his shocking return at the WWE Survivor Series, CM Punk has been the talk of the town in the wrestling business. Every single podcast, every single YouTube channel, everybody in their mom that is in the pro wrestling media world has been talking about CM Punk. And rightfully so. The guy is a lightning rod for attention, for controversy. The man is on the tip of everybody's tongue. all know what I like to do here on this show is I like to do reviews and reactions and just kind of talk about the different stories that are talked about in these podcasts. Problem is, everybody's talking about CM Punk. Where do you even start? So what I decided to do is kind of curate a collection for you guys here and kind of cherry pick different topics that kind of take different directions with the return of CM Punk to kind of get a more well-rounded analysis of the overall return of punk, what it means in the greater context of everything in the wrestling world, 
And to help me do that, we are going to play through a series of clips here. Now, for the short attention span, people, I will probably at some point uh, soon make it a point to break these clips up and try to, you know, in smaller portions, each individual clip. But uh, I did want to have this curated collection of everybody talking about the big return of CM Punk because we have not seen news this, you know, this topical, everybody talking about a subject like this since Vince McMahon getting fired, since TKO buying WWE, since Jay Briscoe passing. You know, these are the biggest stories that I've had to cover, and this one is right up there with it. So uh, to kind of first break the, you know, just kind of wet the whistle here a little bit. Uh, I want to play this clip from Sean Ross Sapp as he kind of goes into detail uh, more just about exactly what was going on and what he is being told, what he was in the know of going into this, and now what he's being told coming out of this as far as the meat and potatoes, nuts and bolts of CM Punk's actual return to the WWE. Check out this clip from Fightful, The Hump. Again, you never said he was or wasn't going to be there. You only said what you and, were told until, by personnel. Until he was backstage, then I did say he was going to be there. <laughs> until he was backstage. Triple H in the scrum kind of you know, verified what you had said because he said speculation was just speculation. And this came together quick. Do you have anything to add as far as this deal coming together? Yeah, I found out on November 19th that CM Punk and Triple H had a an hour-long phone call. But even as of that point, his own friends were being told, don't know if Survivor Series is going to be a thing. But, I mean, Denise even said it on our, our Raw Post show. Because after that show, I said to her, remember me telling you this. CM Punk and Triple H had an hour-long conversation. I actually communicated that with the higher-up that also did not know until... I think the hours before Punk showed up because I was asking WWE reps as of the day of, and as of that afternoon, it still wasn't confirmed to them and the PR team and, and all that. Um, that. The creative team was never clued in at any point clued in. So that's something that they've sort of had to adjust. They didn't have to change much of raw as a result because uh, there, there wasn't a lot of it to, to really go through there. We had just broken on fightful select that, uh, that there are several in WWE who have been told that he's got a behavioral clause, which really? there, there's an awful lot to it. Uh, I haven't spoken to punk personally. Again, you, you, it's always tough to gauge like who the hell he wants to talk to, who he doesn't understandable, but there were a lot of people that were immediately trying to say, Oh, well he was taking shots at the bucks, etc." People close to him tell me that he wants to kind of move, put that past him. And that's what a lot of the I've changed is about. I think that even at this point, he's got to kind of realize like this doesn't squarely fall on everybody else. It can't be everybody else at some point. And that's something Triple H said, too, in the media scrum after Survivor Series was that it was something that came together very quickly. Uh, it was something that was pretty much last minute. You know, they had had their talks. As Sean Ross Sapp said, maybe a week before, they had an hour-long talk, but nothing was official until it was official. Punk living right there in Chicago could just fucking scooch right over and just be there on the spot, you know, before the end of the show. So last-minute situation there. And then the, the situation with the clause in the contract, the behavioral clause, that's interesting, too. Uh, I definitely see why they would do it. Uh, WWE has no actual need for CM Punk for business. Uh, maybe they do. We'll get to that here in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but really, they're you know, Punk is lucky to be there. So this behavioral clause kind of protects WWE, gives them an easy out if Punk does decide to be a punk because look man you know everybody's like oh yeah he was super friendly backstage and all of that but everybody kind of forgets how soon we forget when cm punk made his debut to aew what was the criticism of punk for several weeks after he debuted Right? Nice guy, Phil. PG Punk. And that's what everybody's saying about him again with his promo that he did on Raw. You know, very nice guy, Phil. Oh, you know, I'm home now. 
You know, the guy that hated WWE for years and years now hypocritically is, oh, I love WWE now. This is my home. It's where I was wanting to be, bro. <clears throat> so everybody's kind of criticizing nice guy Phil, PG Punk. Has he been tamed? Has he been pussified? Did he lose his edge? Well, as Punk put when he returned to AEW, when he was asked about that, be careful what you ask for and, and pff, careful what you wish for, man. AEW certainly got the edgier version of Phil at some point, did they not? Which leads me to my next clip here as, you know, what led to CM Punk get freed up to be available for WWE? Now, of course, we all know what happened, but... Was it on purpose? Did Punk quit? Or did he purposely get himself fired so that he could go to WWE? Dutch Mantel thinks he might. Check out this clip. You can say what you want to about CM Punk, but the one thing you have to say is he knows how to get people to talk about him. I'm, I'm going to put you on a spot here. Do you think that CM Punk got himself fired from AEW on purpose? Yes, I do. Really? I didn't originally think that, but I think that he wanted them to fire him because that goes right along with his... He's a... He's a maverick. Nobody tells him what to do. If you fire me, good, fire me. He didn't care. And originally, I didn't think that, but now as time went on, I, I think that he got himself fired on purpose. Now, that may or may not be. Certainly, that was the speculation at the time because Punk had just come back from Brawl Out, from the big... You know, everybody thought he was going to get fired for the shit that happened with the Young Bucks and the fight and the, the drama and the, the press conference and all of that. Punk comes back and he immediately just starts like trying to choke people and choke Tony and fucking sucker punching people or whatever he's doing backstage. He's trying to get fired, is he not? Is he really just that short tempered that? These idiots and morons and douchebags that he's working with backstage, allegedly, you know, in his opinion, are uh, children, are just pissing him off so bad that he just can't help himself? Or was he more devious about it? Was he like, fuck, I got to get out of here, but I got this contract. I can't, I got to, I'm just going to, I'm going to try to choke Tony Khan. That'll get me fired. We'll see if we can do that. What was it really like? What was going on there? Well, Bully Ray asked Mark Henry on the Busted Open radio show. Uh, Mark Henry worked with CM Punk backstage in AEW. Mark was there. He was physically there. And Bully Ray put Mark Henry on the spot. What was it like? What was it really like? What really happened? Check out this clip. Mark, listen. Um, I never like to put uh, fuck it. You were there with him. You were there with him. You are the best first hand account of how he was in AEW. So you're telling us he wanted to put people over. He wanted to do business the right way. He wanted to do all of these positive things, but somehow, some way we, we got a bunch of negativity with him. Why? I, I wish I knew. I think that uh, old regimes and new regimes, you you have to put that in the front right away. And I don't think that, it, and it's is my opinion, like, you know, it's not uh, etched in stone or anything, but uh, everybody was not on the same page, I don't think. I think that, you know, like, um, there was a, a aura of um, the old guard and the new guard, and we're more important one way or the other. Like, you should listen to me. I, I, I've been there, done that before. You should listen to us. We know the pulse of the future. 
So it was just, I feel like that you got to put all of your cards on the table and everybody talk and communicate. Like if you don't talk and communicate, then you're going to have issues. So he's kind of trying to give a little bit of a political answer there, but reading between the lines, it was a difference of opinion between him and the elite, him and the young box, him and the EVPs most likely. Probably even him and Tony, or maybe Tony was caught in the middle and just didn't know what the fuck to think. <clears throat> but Punk, old school, box, new school, clashing heads. It was probably a good idea to have Punk on collision. Give him, if he was a secret EVP, which I've speculated that he was, uh, that because he was, remember, he also had two contracts. That's quickly forgotten about, too, that he is fired from both of his contracts from AEW. What was that other contract besides the wrestler contract? Was it a secret EVP contract? Because he was, we're trying to run a business here, said Angry Phil eating his muffins. And why he was butting heads with the elite, the EVPs, the other EVPs. <clears throat> That's why. That's what was going on. So maybe it did make sense to give them each their own show, and let's try to do it that way. That made sense, theoretically. Um, but if you buy into what Dutch was kind of speculating there, maybe Punk just wanted his way out. Maybe for Punk, he realized that, you know what? The grass is not always greener on the other side of that WWE fence. And that is what Booker T had speculated. As he was the topic of discussion on Booker T's podcast, the Hall of Fame, with Brad Gilmore. Brad Gilmore kind of playing more of the hypocritical role. Punk a little bit more of a hypocrite to him. Booker T just kind of sees it as, LOL, AEW probably sucks, and Punk realized it. Check out this clip. The return of one Phil Brooks, one CM. Punk uh, made his uh, return to the WWE. Um, according to according to CM Punk, uh, after uh, Monday Night Raw's um, promo, he's back home. What do you think about that? Said. What do you think about uh, that? I was surprised to hear that. I, I was surprised to hear that also. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know that he ever had considered it. You know, his home um, before. Um, and I know people are, have been waiting to hear you know you and I's thoughts because we've been critical, or at least I have for sure, been critical of of, of CM Punk and the way he's conducted himself and the way he's acted uh, since he made his wrestling return. And um, you know, I remember he uh, when he came back to AEW, he said that um, some amount of years ago he he left pro wrestling when he left Ring of Honor, he left pro wrestling, and then now he's made his return back to pro wrestling as being in AEW. And now right. I guess he's returned back to. Uh, to uh to sports entertainment. I, I was surprised to hear him say that because look, there, obviously he said a lot of things about the company um over the years, has had a lot of bad blood for the company. Some of it understandable, some of it not. Um, so I, I was surprised not only to see him, but to call to see him call it home. Yeah. Um you remember um CM Punk made a quote when he was in AW, he was talking about younger guys may be thinking about going to the other side. And he said the the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. Um, but in certain places, like in Arizona, you can water that damn grass all day long and it ain't going to turn green. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You feel me? You know where I'm coming from? And, and maybe, maybe um, CM Punk, you know, figured that out after a minute being in AEW, working with you know certain guys. Say, 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 um, for instance, when I went to TNA, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I thought the grass was greener on the other side, but I thought we could get some synthetic, and then we could make the. <laughs> It's some Astro turf. Exactly. It made this thing work. <laughs> but it did, for me, it did, you know, it, it never worked out. It never panned out. And in a couple of years, boom, I was out of there. And, you know, maybe CM Punk, like I say, felt that, uh, you know, man, maybe this ship can't be righted. And uh, let me get the hell out of here and try, try to get back into WWE. So, you know, I get it. I get it 100%. 
I do find it kind of funny, these guys that were super critical and kind of haters of punk. Booker T was certainly not a fan of punk. Not He's, he's very, like, he likes to throw his low, bro, low blow jabs at AEW2 all the time, and he was very critical of punk during punk's entire run from his very first debut return promo. Booker T made news as being the one guy that thought it was a bad promo. And has kind of been a, a hater ever since. But now all of a sudden he's like, ah, ha, I get it. He wants to go back. And yes, he is kind of having a laugh about it. Uh, but him and Eric Bischoff, which we'll play a clip from later, was also kind of, oh, well, you know, I think it'll be a great success. And we'll get to that clip and everything. But it's weird how people kind of change their tune a little bit now that Punk's back over on the WWE side of things with these people that are clearly anti-AEW. But I digress. Punk now back in the WWE where he got his star, where he got his big break after coming out of Ring of Honor. And speaking of Punk's big break in WWE... One guy chiming in on all the CM Punk talk and trying to capitalize on that, just like me, by the way. Thank you for your view, if you're still here, was Maven, Maven's YouTube channel. And he took a little bit of a different approach, and he kind of talked about his unique uh, perspective as being the guy who had CM Punk's first match ever in the WWE, back when nobody knew who the fuck he was, unless they were watching Ring of Honor. Check out this clip. And there we get our first first sighting of punk. When I first met punk, it was actually through Stevie Richards. Stevie came up to me earlier in that day, and punk and Stevie were were friends at the time. And Stevie asked me, he was like, Maven, I want to have make I want to make sure punk has a good showing. Can you guys do everything in your power to you know, to to put forth a good match. I was like, absolutely. Oh, then bitten off more than they but you can see these two guys are taking on right here. Did somebody cover these guys. Hook in the leg Forget from Maven. About it. Okay, right there is exactly where we went against management. The one thing management wanted, they wanted us to get the pinfall victory, the one, two, three on CM Punk. And for whatever reason, I have no clue. I mean, he wasn't even a signed talent at the time, but he already had heat in the company. There were already feathers he had ruffled. I don't know how and I don't know whose. Nova saw it different. Nova wanted to give the guy a, a, a chance. And Nova made the decision that earlier on when we were going over the match backstage, he said, once we come in, I'm going to knock you out, punk. You roll to the floor. Go to the floor. That way we can get the... Slam, one, two, three, on Simpson. I don't know why Simon wanted to protect Punk. Uh, it could have been a favor to Stevie, like Stevie asked us earlier in the day, or he might have seen in Punk what the entire world would come to see years later. Simon was always a good gauge of talent. He also, he might have known that Punk, for whatever reason, had heat backstage and he was just doing everything in his power to protect him, knowing that if there was any trouble to be had, it was going to fall on us. And by us, I mean Simon. So the question remains, how do we then not get in trouble for disobeying direct orders? Therein lies the genius with Simon Dean. Simon, knowing they wanted the pinfall to be on Punk, knew, also knew that during this time, we were gonna have time cues to hit. So by telling Punk, when I hit you, roll to the floor, rather than standing up on the apron so you can be tagged back in, if you're on the floor, we're gonna have to go with the flow. We're gonna have to finish the match, thus being able to get the slam and finish on Russell Simpson. So to management, it looks like a miscommunication and an improvisation by us, when in reality, it was all thought about ahead of time by the creator of the Simon system. And this is actually probably even news to Punk. I just wanted to slip that one into the mix because it was a different perspective on the whole CM Punk thing. And you only have one first match in WWE, even if it was a tryout, you know, wasn't under his contract or anything. But it was the first time Punk wrestled in a WWE ring and it was against 
Maven. So that's pretty fun. Uh, but Punk now back in the house. That is WWE. Of course, this was something that people said would never, ever, ever happen. And one person that said, of course it would fucking happen. Are you stupid? Was Jim Cornette. And Jim Cornette was on his podcast, The Jim Cornette Experience, with Brian Last talking about just that. About him being the one guy or one of the few guys out there saying that, of course, it makes all the business sense in the world for Punk to go back to the WWE. Everybody would be insane to not do that. And then even he was about to give up hope until Punk did finally show up. Check out this clip. But all these people on the Internet, the naysayers, no, Uncle Dave said it. I've talked to my story. It's not going to happen. They say it's not going to take blah, 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 blah. And I said at the time, well, if it was going to happen, that's the first thing I'd fucking say anyway, right? How can this not happen? It makes too much sense and they'll make too much money and it, it will work on so many levels to send a message to the other company at the top and to the locker room at the bottom to again, hot shot ratings in a time of rights renegotiations but this is what we're talking about and that's why i said they got to do this and everybody else was shooting it down on the internet to the point where finally i said on the drive-thru i said well i guess they if everybody else is saying that this ain't happening fuck i guess they don't need to make 50 million dollars anymore go look the clip up people I i said how can this not happen guess what it fucking happened And I was saying it all along, because how can it not fucking happen? It's tens of millions of dollars that this company can fucking make. And at the same time, literally backhand bitch slap, the only competition they have in this country that they can see with binoculars behind them. And they did both at the same time. Right. It makes all the business sense and the money sense in the world. It is hypocritical. Absolutely. And all of those people saying, oh, Punk would never be hypocritical. He'll never go back to WWE, which, you know, I probably would have been one of those people that might have said, you know what? I just don't see it because and and I'm sure I have said that because I've speculated on this to death before it actually happened. Um, But, you know, it was a tough sell to see Punk back in the WWE ring and especially playing ball, calling it home, calling it home. One person glad to have CM Punk back on board, back in the family, and one person with a unique perspective on CM Punk as well as the heartbreak kid Shawn Michaels, the head of NXT who recently just said he would be happy to have Punk in NXT before Punk showed up to Survivor Series because Shawn Michaels has the unique perspective of being that guy in the locker room that everybody fucking hates. That outspoken, cocky, brash, arrogant, but can back it up by being the best for business. And that's why you can't get rid of them. That was Shawn Michaels in the 90s. To an extent, there's a lot of parallels there. So Michaels has a unique perspective on punk. And he talked about that here with Peter Rosenberg on Rosenberg Wrestling. I guess he's got another YouTube, separate YouTube. It looks to be brand new. Uh, but he's got an interview with the Heartbreak Kid, and they talked about CM Punk. What's it like, though, Sean? You've had those days where you had your people, quite literally the clique, who have your back, and then you have uh, some more people um, who aren't happy to see you, and then others who are indifferent. What is that feeling like, you know, you're walking in with your suitcase, heading in down the ramp into the building, when you know kind of every corner you turn might be a, a mixed reaction in the eyes. Yeah, well, early on, it's it's uncomfortable. Um, but again, when, but I think after a while, you get used to it. Look, everybody would prefer to be liked, uh, you know, but if you're somebody, second guessing uh, is always going to go on this line of work. This just, it is impossible to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. Um, and Look, you know as well as I do, uh, in any line of work and in any walk of life, there you know everybody can say I really like this guy and they get along with him, and they're talking about him two minutes later anyway. 
And and that goes for everybody, even the most liked individuals. And so um, I don't know. I think this he's been doing this for a long time. Uh, again, I, I, I guess I always say, like, I don't know. I always liked Phil and and and, and I, I, I don't know. And I always understood the, you know, heaven forbid you have a different opinion. Um, I don't know. I'm, I, that, that, that kind of stuff doesn't bother me. I love that take from Shawn Michaels because, you know, like he said, heaven forbid you have an opinion. Now, I think it was a little bit more than that. Punk had opinions with his fists and with his hands strangling and choking out people. But regardless, yes, he's one of those people, Shawn Michaels, who knows what it's like to be hated by everybody in the locker room. But to be so goddamn good that you just can't get rid of him. So you have to put up with his little punk ass, but you would love to just strangle him and punch him out. And and the things he says and does are controversial on the mic and all of that. So that's, that's CM Punk in today's era. But, you know, with all that, we're happy to have him here. And this is his home and all of that, blah, 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 blah. Is there more of an ulterior motive? Obviously, WWE is living their best life right now, are they not? That was one of the many criticisms of, you know, one of the, for everybody that was saying that Punk will never be back in WWE, or why would they want to take on CM Punk? He's drama, he's a cancer. Why would they want to do that? And stir up their locker room when they have their everything's going perfect, everything's golden. WWE's doing their best business ever. Well, Eric Bischoff had a little bit of speculation on the Strictly Business podcast that he actually got from Conrad Thompson. So I guess the credit goes to Conrad. But Bear, uh, Bischoff was the one speaking it here that uh, maybe WWE's reason for signing CM Punk has to do and placing him on the Raw brand. Might have to do with the fact that WWE is trying to sell that Raw show. And that might just be what puts him over the top. Remember, CM Punk was basically given his own show by turn. Collision. So certainly he could be uh, quite the draw to some of these networks. Check out this clip. Conrad said, I believe we're going to see CM Punk back in WWE. Before the end of the year, and I said, I don't think so. It doesn't make sense to me. They don't need him right now. The Survivor Series is sold out. It's already getting a ton of buzz. Where is the added value? Now, this is not my opinion of CM Punk, the performer, or Phil Brooks, the individual. But just because WWE is so freaking hot right now, that there is no hole in their roster. There's not a need. So it was like, if you're going to pull that trigger and bringing in a, bring in a guy who is as controversial as punk is, and who has done a great job of keeping himself front and center in terms of controversy. Um, why would you use it on a night when you don't need it? Now, Conrad, on the other hand, his position was, mm, They're negotiating for TV rights for Raw, and perhaps that added level of chatter or internet wrestling buzz and reaction to Punk coming in, maybe that would be enough to push a deal over the top. The Turner Network... The Turner Network was really high on CM Punk when he was in AEW. They were really pushing, as part owners... They were really pushing to keep CM Punk and to give him a whole show. Make it the CM Punk show. They have their little marketing, you know. They do their little market research gimmicks and that sort of thing. Eric Bischoff talks about it a lot on his show, the market research that they would do. And one of the big things uh, that these networks were coming up with with wrestling is that fans love CM Punk. That there's something about Punk as the meme says over there. How about that meme, by the way? Look at that uh, that meme over there. That's some dope shit, right? That that might be my personal best. I've had some good ones. I think the last time I said that was the one of Tony Khan uh, snorting coke and drinking coffee and just being... Uh, yeah, that was a fun one. But this, 
This might be a fun one. It might be my best work yet. But <clears throat> I digress. I digress. CM Punk could be that last crown jewel that WWE could use to put them over the top in a in their bargaining for a potential TV deal for Monday Night Raw with whatever networks are left in the hunt. That won't be Warner Brothers Discovery. We'll talk about that later on in a future clip or in a separate clip if you are uh, watching just the clips. But finally here, our last clip, speaking of clips, comes from our good old friend Mick Foley, jolly old St. Mick. Always the purest of hearts. Had also an interesting take on this. Now that Punk is back in the WWE, we've covered everything that brought us to this point and all the takes on him signing. But now we have Mick Foley's take on the busted open radio show. On I hope Punk enjoys this because Punk's kind of proven that he's making more headlines with all of his drama and all of his negativity than just being part of the product and being a successful part of the product and enjoying the product. This was Mick Foley's take from his personal experience with Punk. Check out this clip. And he's laying the groundwork for what should be an incredible run if he can remember, this is like one thing I used to tell him is Phil and I were pretty close at one time and he couldn't get, he couldn't get motivated for the undertaker. And he felt like they'd taken that main event spot away from him. And I'd say, Phil, the main event is what the fans decide. The main event is Amen. You know, right. You go out there and you decide what your own WrestleMania moments are. So like, I don't brag about much, but I felt like Edge and I had the match of the night in 2006, and no one will be able to tell me differently. So that was my WrestleMania moment. I didn't need somebody stamping the words main event on it to tell me how I felt when that match was done. And so I was like, man, I just feel like if you can't appreciate working with Undertaker at, um, at WrestleMania, and if you win the AEW title and the focus becomes not on the joy of that title, but on airing your grievances, then you've done a disservice to the title. This is all that I'm going to say also when he had the interaction uh, with uh, Jungle Boy. Uh, if the feeling after drawing the largest uh, non WWE crowd in the history of the United Kingdom is not on that crowd, but on a backstage fight, again, you've done a disservice to the company so i hope this is going to be punk's last run i hope he finds a way to enjoy it i i believe he'll do whatever he needs to do to be as good as he can possibly be i don't i disagreed with a couple of those guys the great worker thing was something else you know because a i've seen punk granted you know 10 years ago up close enough times and i was one of the guys pushing for uh, him to come into WWE after watching him in Ring of Honor. So I know this guy has torn down the house over the course of a few decades now, and I know he has the pride to tear it down again. I just hope as a human being that Phil will, I, I mean, I'm not trying to be cave, but that Punk will enjoy it and and rise to the occasion of the big moments so that we as fans are talking about what we should be talking about when those matches are over and not some, uh, you know, extracurricular activity. Can I just pause and give myself a little bit of credit for making it through nine separate clips, nine separate segues, transitions, weaving that story in together. I actually plotted that one out a little bit, kind of picking which pieces tell the full story of this punk puzzle. And uh, can we just acknowledge how fucking, how fucking impressed with myself I am for being able to pull that off. If you're looking for a host, anybody out there in TV land, you're looking to pay people the monies for hosting gigs, I got you covered. I can do it. I got those transitions down pat. That was some fine work, son. But Mick Foley's not wrong. Back to Mick Foley. 
Hopefully Punk can enjoy it. Hopefully Punk realizes that this is his last chance in professional wrestling. CM Punk has two roads in front of him right now. <clears throat> he has, and these are the, the roads to his legacy. He has one road that leads down the same path that the ultimate warrior took. You know, and even Warrior was able to come back, thankfully, before he died, make peace, make amends, give that one last final eerie promo. But Punk can take the path of the self-destruction of Phil Brooks, the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, the self-destruction of CM Punk, the most hated, the most controversial, the guy that ruined himself because of his attitude. Because he just couldn't get along with anybody backstage. He completely ruined and tarnished his legacy of what would have been a great legacy. One of the all-time greats ruined, forgotten to history because of his shitty attitude and personality. That's path one. That was almost how he had left it when he left WWE to begin with. But he kind of became a cult hero because he was standing up to the machine, right? Right. Standing up to Vince's corporate tyranny, to the bullshit booking, to all of that. Apologize, he said. And you will apologize, and you will like it. I apologize, you son of a bitch. And then he went to AEW and tried to help them because they were the... the, the they were the counter to Vince McMahon's product. They were the underdogs, the alternative brand. But Punk couldn't make it work there either, which started to make people like me kind of go, okay, man, I loved Punk, and he was my anti-hero because of I believed everything he said about WWE. But now he's got all these problems with AEW? Maybe it's just Punk. Maybe at some point, maybe the problem's just Punk if problems happen everywhere you go. But Punk's got a clean slate now, back in WWE, Everything's clean. Everything's clear. Hopefully, Punk has the opportunity to take that other path towards the Hall of Fame, towards ending his career on a good note, one last great run, some big headline. I mean, he could have that second half of his career like Shawn Michaels had. Where Shawn Michaels, remember, when he came back, he was even though he had a world title win, he was never a top he was never the top guy. He was a top guy, not the top guy. That's the run you do with Shawn Michaels or with CM Punk. You bring him back to be involved in big feuds, big storyline angles, and just be that co-headliner, that co-main event, that that extra cherry on top to entice people into buying the pay-per-view or just watching the show or buying going the tickets or whatever the fuck, right? People, he's going to sell tickets, I'll tell you that. Next time Rock comes around the horn, I'm going to go there because Punk will be there. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a good deal. And hopefully he can, you know, he can ride that wave. He can have some, some of the best matches of his career cut, some of the best matches, promos of his career, and leave that legacy behind where he leaves with honor instead of in disgrace. And he can go on to have that Hall of Fame run. Hell, even maybe make peace with AEW. Who knows? Uh, but if history is any indication, Punk is a lightning rod for controversy. Never afraid to speak his mind. And what happens when him and Triple H butt heads creatively? What happens when Road Dog, who's never been a fan of Punk? You know, we heard that both Nick Khan and Triple H were not at Raw last week. Well, Punk was. And Punk's time was cut on Raw, too, wasn't it? His promo. Hmm. Who cut his time if Triple H and, and Nick Khan weren't there? Was it Road Dog? Who runs Who runs Raw? Who runs the show in Triple H's absence? Is it Road Dog? Is it William Regal? Who also we've heard speculation that Punk kind of butted heads with in AEW. I don't like you. You're a stooge for Triple H, right? That was the rumored thing. Who knows if that's true or not? It is the internet after all. This one has gone long, and I think we've covered all of our bases here, you know, uh, other than, yeah, what happens if one things do go bad for Punk? Can he, can he bite his tongue? Can he play ball? Can he be corporate? It's his last chance. If he doesn't, he's not going to get another one. I'll tell you that much. 
But uh, that's my thoughts. I'd love to hear all your thoughts. And awesome thank you guys if you stuck around and checked out all these clips. This one was a particular chore to kind of arrange, to edit, to get through. But uh, it was fun and kind of worth it because everybody's talking about punk. And it was worth it for that meme alone. And uh, like I said, I'll probably chop it up. Though, if you're still listening now, you've listened to them all, so it does, doesn't matter anyway. Uh, peace, love, and pizza. I am your boy, Seth Grimes. My voice is starting to hurt after that one. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. Matt Hardy just recently celebrated his 100th episode of his podcast with John Alba, The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. And on this particular episode, he had his brother, Brother Nero, Jeff Hardy, join him for a portion of the interview. He also had the private party on for a little bit. Uh, But it was in this particular series of clips here that I kind of chopped up for you where Matt Hardy made some news as Matt and Jeff Hardy both kind of chimed in on some of their recent frustrations with the booking in AEW and their spots on the card. Check out this clip. Stuff happened. And then like, you know, Jeff came back, but we were hoping we, you know, Jeff has proved himself. And Jeff, I've never mm-hmm. seen him in such an amazing and great place in his life. Like he's unreal. And uh, I, I felt like we'd eventually get back in there, you know, especially once they said, okay, well, he's cool. You know, maybe like, you know, let him, you know, dip his toes in the water. Let's see how he's doing. Let's see how he's getting in. You know, he's great. You know, and, and it never happened all the way yet, you know, up to our expectations, what we would like to do. I mean, and I'll say, I mean, just creatively, like just the way we've been utilized, like the last four months, it's been very frustrating. We've been very patient, but there has been a lot of frustration, in the things we've done and kind of how we've been utilized in some ways. I, I want to own in on the frustrations part. You just said you, you mentioned that you guys have felt some frustration since you kind of came back into the fold here as a tag team. Is it frustrations with creative? Is it just not being able to latch on to the right idea? W- what are we referring to here when we talk about wanting to better your position? I, it, it, frustration with direction, I would say more than anything else. You know, there, there was a couple of times, uh, we, we just want to have a direction and a story and, and be able to go down that path. We feel like there's been a couple of things that we've kind of talked about doing, you know, over the last few months and like stuff has changed, you know, so that, that that's probably the frustration. I guess that would be a frustration with creative. I, I mean, I, I just feel like because we are considered one of the most, uh, one of the most iconic tag teams, one of the greatest tag teams of all time, you know, with all of our achievements and, you know, all the ground we've broken, all the the trails we've blazed. And sure, we're not Matt and Jeff Hardy of 1999 and 2000, but, like, there's so much we can do to help young guys. I think the last time I was in this, uh, you know, extreme dimension of y'all's podcast, I said that in WWE I, I felt like I was a ghost just walking around backstage. And honestly, man, I've kinda, I kind of still feel like that at AEW uh, just because not being involved in something – you know, cool. And, and I feel like there's something so special that we, we have within us to really bring out. And that brings me to uh, ego. Uh, the lady that's another wrestler said, you've, you've never had an ego, but I think that's what I, I need to, I need to bring my ego back, uh, you know, 10 times more intense than it was when, when mm-hmm. I was the antichrist of professional I was wrestling. chanting antichrist. In the yeah, for in sure. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a good gauge of if you're fucking up or not as a company, a wrestling company, if the Hardy boys, if Matt Hardy is complaining to the point where he's taking his complaints to the internet, Matt Hardy is the ultimate optimist. That's all he is, is positive energy. He's not a bitcher. He's not a complainer. He's not a guy that takes his grievances to the internet. He always looks at things on the bright side. And as you even heard in that clip, he was trying to look on the bright side of things and keep a positive attitude. But once you get to the point where the Hardys are bitching publicly, there's a problem. Now, take it with a grain of salt because they were scheduled to win the tag team championships and do exactly what Matt is talking about. Be a prominently featured tag team 
that is given just enough credibility to be able to pass that credibility on, give the rub to the younger people, and help a bunch of other teams come up. And at the time that that was going to happen, AEW had arguably the greatest tag team roster ever assembled in, in since the 80s of professional wrestling. You know, back when, you know, the Legion of Doom and the Rockers and the Heart Foundation and Demolition and fucking, eh, holy shit, Arn and Tully, all of them. You know what I mean? That was a stacked card of tag teams. But you look at, I'm sure I'm forgetting some good ones from back then. That's just WWF, not to mention Rock and Roll Express and the Midnights and all of them. <clears throat> But AEW at one time, look, proud and powerful were, were you know, and the, the acclaimed were running hot. FTR, the Young Bucks, they had a very stacked tag team roster. And uh, I think it's it has fallen off completely since then. Uh, but look, they were scheduled for that run as tag team champions. And guess what fucked it up? Jeff Hardy. Jeff Hardy fucked it up. When Jeff Hardy fucked up for the bajillionth time. And uh, look, we're going to cover Sonny here later on the episode in a different clip. If you're watching just clips on YouTube. Uh, it was Sonny sentenced to 17 years in prison for a DUI. For her multiple DUI. What's the difference between her and Jeff Hardy? She killed a guy. Jeff didn't. But what Jeff easily could have. So I think, and, you know, look, Matt acknowledged that at the beginning of that clip there. But <clears throat> he's kind of taking the perspective of like, well, look, Jeff's been doing great. <clears throat> he's proven himself. Let's get back to our spot now. Let's get a let's get a bone thrown to us. I don't blame Tony Khan for being apprehensive or just not having... Maybe, you know, he's got so many wrestlers, and look, the Hardys were out of the picture for such a long time that now, like, you know, we'll squeeze you in when we got time for you kind of thing, which is not great either. If you don't got time for the Hardys on three shows. But, look, the Hardys, they're there now, and they seem optimistic about the direction that they could be going. They seem like they want to do a heel turn. They want to use their public frustrations. And this could all be a work. This could be them setting the seeds for turning heel and being frustrated on TV. And I would do that, actually. I would book them as a heel team. It would give interest in the Hardys again. But they got to be dangerous heel teams, you know, despicable. They got to, like, carry their chairs around because of the TLC matches, right? And they got to be going around just assaulting people with chairs, beatdowns of other tag teams in the locker room and that sort of thing. And just they're frustrated. They want their spot, and they're going to take people out till they get their spot. That would be a fun little angle for the Hardys, and I like that. But I think... They should have a prominent spot. I think they're right. As the Hardy Boys, as legends, as icons, as in the twilight of their career here where they still have something left to give, they should be giving it. And that's why you pay them a shit ton of money and have them on their roster. On your roster is to utilize that history of them to help bring up new people. They've tried with the private party a little bit, but eh, eh, private parties. Not going anywhere anytime soon up the card. But I think they could do, I, I think they could be very useful to the tag team division to help spike the tag team, reignite shit in the tag team division for AEW. But, you know, Jeff Hardy is one bad day away from it all falling apart again. And how many second, third, fourth, fifth chances has Jeff been given? So I also cannot blame anybody at all for being apprehensive. You know, just lucky he even has a job right now. And being able to prove himself is keeping him on the, on the you know, Tony. Tony doesn't fire people other than CM Punk. But, you know, he was on record as saying Jeff's going to have to kind of show that he has turned a new leaf, that he can maintain sobriety and be clean and not get himself in any more trouble. Because next time he's out, 
He was given that ultimatum. So I don't blame Tony if that's his apprehension, but how long do you wait? And how much more time, you know, not only contract-wise what's left on their contracts, but how much more time on their careers, on their bodies? Will Matt and Jeff even be able to have matches with other teams? Give them a heel run, and then that way they won't need to be doing tons of flippies and swantons and all that shit either. They can just be dirty, nasty heels. And they can take people out. I think it's worth giving them a try and see where it goes. I don't think that... I think as of right now, they're being wasted. And I, I don't think that there's good reason to waste the Hardy Boys because they're they're just so iconic and legendary. I'm not saying push them to the moon, and that's not what they're saying either. Utilize them to help build new stars and build a new division. And I think you could absolutely do that if you put some effort into it. But, eh. You know, there's some people on the roster who haven't been complete and total fuck-ups either that might like a try. So, uh, you can take it either way, but that's just my thoughts. But I I would say, look, uh, it's not a good look for AEW with all the other shit that they're dealing with to have a guy like Matt Hardy out there criticizing you now because he's not only been one of Tony's most vocal supporters, and he was on this show too, He backed it up by saying, you know, Tony's a great boss. He gives him time off when he needs it, yada, yada. But when Matt Hardy's that strong of an ally for you week after week, and he's kind of a simp almost, and now he's out here criticizing, bro, tighten up your shit. Tighten it up. These conversations should be happening backstage, and the fact that they're now happening in public means that they're either that, that, that door is not being opened or... You're just not being receptive to what they're being told or you're not being clear. Like, hey, I still don't trust Jeff enough yet to really put any kind of steam behind him. I don't know, man. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. How would you utilize the Hardy Boys? Do you like my idea and what kind of sounded like it was their idea too, to turn them heel, vicious heels? And, and kind of use that to give them credibility, but also build up the tag team division around them and the younger guys. Or do you think they're overrated, washed up, and it's probably better that they're off the card or just on rampage for smaller matches? Um, or do you think Jeff Hardy just hasn't earned it yet? Or maybe it should just be lucky he has a job at all? I want to know all of it. Let me know your thoughts down in those comments below. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. That's what it is, right? It's, oh, yeah. Well, to seemingly rub salt in the wounds of AEW, kicking them while they're already down, curled up in the fetal position, is now making the news rounds that Warner Brothers Discovery, the parent company of TBS and TNT, which are the channels that host AEW's content, are now the top bidder and uh, most likely choice to buy the rights for WWE's Monday Night Raw program, which is making the rounds right now, being shopped around to different networks. Uh, For more on this, and spoiler alert, by the way, it's complete bullshit. But for more on this, to kind of dive into uh, the nitty-gritty and the details on this, first want to play a clip from JD from NY, JD from New York. And uh, he had some guy on his show, I don't fucking know. And he brought up to JD this news that is seemingly making the rounds is Warner Brothers Discovery the top bidder for Monday Night Raw? And if they are, is this the death nail for AEW? Check out this clip. It okay. seems as if the WWE Raw deal is going to be announced very, very shortly. It seems like Warner Media Discovery is going to be a head bidder for WWE Raw. Get JD, I, I ask you this. If they go to T, if WWE gets Monday Night Raw on TNT or TBS, is AEW dying? <laughs> yes. 
Yes, they are. I didn't right. think that was a possibility. Neither. Man, but why would saying- they make that? What, what's what, what's with all the fucking smoke and mirrors? Tony Khan, oh, I love, I'm not going to do anything to disrupt the partnership. There's a great partnership with Warner Brothers Discovery, and they love us, and we love them, and all this other bullshit. Why would they do that to Tony Khan if there's such a so- great relationship there? So I laughed at this when I first saw it. This re- this was like out a couple months ago, and I laughed at it. But when CM Punk showed up on Saturday, I was like, holy, and he's attached to the Raw brand. I always think of different things than what the typical wrestling fan will look at. They're like, oh, Punk's back. This is awesome. He's going to take out Seth Rollins and Stokely Steve Austin. And yes, well, that's true. But I thought to myself, is this because of Warner Discovery? Are, is WWE... So close to signing, like, the, are they going to get what they want from Warner Media, Warner Discovery? And CM Punk is like the last little, like, eh, sprinkle on that. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. So, so we're, we're really going to get one Bill Phil. And yes, absolutely. If Warner Brothers Discovery were to pick up Monday Night Raw, obviously that would probably pretty much be the end of AEW. Even if they were to find their way onto another network, they're going to die. They're going to fall into that trap that TNA did where they were slowly, once they were on Spike, which was actually a pretty good network, uh, they just slowly, you know, Destination America and wherever the fuck else they ended up on, it was the death of them. And this would absolutely be the death of AEW if they were to lose Warner Brothers Discovery as their network. But... Hold on, because I do have thoughts on that. But before I get to my own personal thoughts, uh, let's check in with our boy Eric Bischoff, who is the foremost authority on network deals and that sort of thing, right? His opinion's always worth its salt because, you know, for all of people's criticisms of Eric on the creative end, the TV business is definitely up his alley. As a TV producer, check out Eric's thoughts on the potential of Monday Night Raw going to Warner Brothers Discovery. So there have been a lot of questions and rumor and innuendo as to where Monday Night Raw is going to land. A lot of people, Eric, think that that announcement is going to come sooner rather than later. I have to source the Wrestling Observer for this because this was their report today. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, I'll leave that jurisdiction up to you. But Dave says that, quote, Regarding WBD, which would be the game changer in many ways if it happened, the WBD version told to many this past week is that Nick Khan last went to WBD in October with a pitch and was turned down. You know, the Warner Brothers Discovery thing to me seems like one of the least more interesting opportunities. But again, I'm not in, man. I don't know what their plans are. What are their goals over the next five years? What's their strategy for the next three years? I don't know. And without some basis of knowledge, all we're doing is whiffing, guessing. So I think there is one, and I'm going to try to be a little analytical here. I think there is one facet at play that has complicated the issue a little bit for raw negotiation rights. And that is what's going on with the NBA. Because the NBA is going to be the premier media property that's going to be hitting the market within the next year. I agree with Eric. And in fact, I'm going to double down on it. And I'm going to say that there is no chance in hell, at least for this go around, who knows what the future holds, but at least for this go around Monday night, raw is not going to Warner brothers discovery. Uh, For those of you who forgot or just don't pay attention or whatever the case may be, we've already covered this here on this show. When we talked about the possibility of Warner brothers discovery, owning a piece of AEW, check out this clip from that episode of Tony Khan being questioned about this. I was just going to ask you, I mean, one of the big questions and one of the big rumors going around has to do with the ownership of the company and WBD. And is there any negotiations going on or anything to, uh, do they own a minority piece or is there any negotiations going on in that direction? Uh, well, it's something we talked about a lot. Uh, there's been a lot of conversations about, uh, about that. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's always been something I've been open to, uh, and, you know, between, 
uh, Warner Brothers Discovery and myself, a lot of the financial and structural details of our partnership we've been able to uh, keep between us. But there are things I've always said to be true, I, that I own 100% of the voting stock in this company uh, and that I have 100% of the decision-making power in the company. Um, and I've been open uh, to taking on additional partnerships or things of that nature, but we have a, a really great deal uh, right now uh, with Warner Brothers Discovery. And, uh, and I would love to uh, have an, uh, an even longer agreement and uh, as for um, them and, and their stake in the business, I mean, uh, that is something that would be between us. Uh, but I would also be open to that, to Warner Brothers uh, in, a, in a future deal, having a piece or a bigger piece potentially. Uh, but I would always want to maintain 100% voting control as I have now. So even though this has not been publicly disclosed by any stretch, I think that's all the proof you really need that Warner Brothers Discovery absolutely owns at least a piece of AEW to some extent. Otherwise, Tony would have just said no. What's the point in trying to kayfabe it like that and play coy? You only do that when there's something there, but you don't want to give details on it. And him even saying, like, look, bro, I will fucking, you know, I'd be open to them taking on a chunk or taking on a bigger chunk. They own a piece of AEW, so they are not going to be in the market for another company. They're just not, especially with the NBA rights deals coming up, as uh, John Alba had said there. That's going to be their main focus. They're going to want to keep their money free for that. And whether they end up getting the NBA rights deal or not, they're already invested in AEW. And I will elaborate more on that here. But I do want to kind of dive in, you know, uh, my journalistic earbuds, kind of, you know, my my. Spider senses started tingling here. My journalistic spider senses wondering where this came from anyway. Uh, so what we did here is I, I tried to kind of track down where people were saying this source came from. So let's hop on over to X Twitter X where we have WrestleMania posted on November 30th here. And shame on WrestleMania, by the way, because I actually like some of their videos and stuff. Um, they listed the top three bidders for WWE's Raw's TV rights in 2024. Warner Brothers Discovery. Bam! Right there. Disney. And that would be for FX, not like the Disney Channel or Disney Plus or anything. And then Amazon for their Prime product, presumably. Not Logan Paul's Prime product. It's a different Prime product. Uh, but then below here, look at this. We follow the trail, right? Oh, you can't see my cursor. Yeah, you can. There it is. It's highlighted. Wrestle World in parentheses as what's that's their, uh, is that the source that they're citing? So what's this wrestle world they speak of? So I hop on over here and I find this from November 28th, a Twitter account by the name of Wrestle World. It's a wrestle world. Yay. Which I have never heard of until I did my research on this. But apparently, look over here on the side, if you can see this trustworthy news and opinions on pro wrestling. Well, I don't know about you guys. But anybody that puts trustworthy as the very first word, trustworthy news, into their news bio, we, why are you trying to oversell yourself, bro? You're really trying to convince me of your trustworthiness. They post here. Look at this. Exclusive. You know what that means? It means they are the ones breaking the news. It means they're not getting it from anywhere else. Wrestle World. You guys all know Wrestle World, right? There's... What? Wrestling Observer with Dave Meltzer. There's Wade Keller's shit. Sean Ross Sapp, Fightful. Right up there with all of them. Wrestle World, right? No? Never heard of them either? Right. Trustworthy news and opinions, though. They post exclusive. We're being told that Raw's next TV deal has either been completed or extremely close to being completed and is expected to be announced. Before 2024, last we heard the top three bidders in order, Warner Brothers, Discovery, Disney, Amazon. Also in the running, <clears throat> NBC Universal, who already has the rights to Raw currently. 
USA, right? That's their exclusive. Now, they do not cite any other sources here. So you know what this is, folks? It's all a big pile of bullshit. A big nothing burger. You're welcome. I already pulled the Tony Khan basically saying, admitting as much that Warner Brothers Discovery is a partial owner of AEW. And now we just trace the source of this all the way back to a super trustworthy news site on Twitter that everybody's heard of. So. Warner Brothers Discovery is not going to be getting raw. Maybe sometime in the future if AEW flops or folds or something goes afoul with them and they do lose their TV rights. But I think, uh, you know, I've said this over and over and over again, but I'll give you a quick refresher before I wrap this up here. Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, David Zaslav, he has been on record very clear about the kind of company that he wants to build. He wants to build fandoms, and he wants to build around non-scripted television and fandoms. Fandoms, non-scripted television. Those were his two big selling points. Non-scripted, sports, reality shows, shit that does not require writers and all that big fucking production staff and all that. Just, like, not TV shows, right? Like, they're not The Sopranos is basically what he's saying. Shit like AEW falls right into non-scripted and sports like content it's also live and all of that and it's very very cheap to produce and they even went as far as to start to try to find other shows to book around aew such as the slap fight such as aew's all access or whatever that show was they are in the aew business they gave aew a whole nother show collision that was their idea now granted that was to be the cm punk show And things obviously have changed, as, you know, we talked about in depth earlier here on the show. But Warner Brothers Discovery, they're not going anywhere. They are partnered up with AEW. They're in cahoots with AEW. And Warner Brothers Discovery owns their brands, by the way. Uh, The ones that they don't own, they will try to license, like the NBA and, you know, AEW. But they own a bit of AEW, but they they own uh, the Harry Potter shit. They got the exclusive rights to that. They own DC, Batman, Superman, Harley Quinn, all of that. They got that too. They own it. They own it. They got their own cartoon, Bugs Bunny, all that shit, the Looney Tunes squad. That's all Warner Brothers, right? So... That's their jam. They are in the the business of owning properties and brands that they can build fandoms around. Hello, which wrestling and you know what Raw would be too, but Raw is not something that they. It, it really seems like Warner Brothers Discovery would rather have their own number two wrestling product, and they're and and Tony Khan always talks about they're the ones who keep trying to educate Tony on the challenger brands. They see AEW as a Pepsi to WWE's Coke. That's probably why they bought into it. It's cheaper. It's reliable. 24, uh, not 24 seven, but 365 content. Uh, It's weekly. It's always going to be there. 52 weeks live. You can depend on it. Like the fucking, you know, you can depend on a minimum fan base that will always be there. Sure. You could put a rerun of a show, but I think people even, uh, highly underrate how much reruns of shows cost. You know, a Big Bang Theory probably cost as much, if not more, than an AEW episode of Dynamite cost to run. That shit's expensive. Very expensive. So that's my piece on this. So I've presented you all of the facts and all of the opinions and giving you my own educated opinion. So next time you see anybody out there speculating, saying, oh, yeah, boo, doo, doo, boo, doo, 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 they're wrong. It's not going to happen. They're full of shit. They're speculating based on speculators. That's all they're doing. There is nothing. There is no smoke to this fire. It's I will eat this foam piece right here on my microphone if uh, with with fucking hot sauce. If Warner Brothers Discovery signs Monday Night Raw on this 
TV deal. That's just my thoughts. Let me know yours down in the comments below. Let me know how you think I might be wrong or <clears throat> did I nail it on the head? Got it. First try. Let me know your thoughts. Where would you like to see Raw end up? Where should Raw end up? I even heard Netflix could be in the in the mix. I love these TV rights deals seasons. This is always exciting. But I wouldn't expect Warner Brothers Discovery to be making any kind of big shakeups with AEW anytime soon. Oh, Sonny, Sonny, Sonny. How far you have fallen for grace. This was once upon a time literally the most downloaded woman in the entire world. In 1996, she was the hottest girl alive. The internet said so. It was unanimous. Hotter than the Pamela Andersons of the time. The Jenny McCarthy's. The whoever, the Hillary Rodham Clintons. Hotter than all of the people that were around in the 1996 era. Sunny. Tammy Sitch. And boy, oh boy, how she has fallen from grace since then her absolute peak stardom she was a household name and now she is sitting in a courtroom and she was sentenced this week to 17 plus years 18 technically but she's got time served and, and such uh, poor Sonny of course you've all heard about this situation I assume right she killed a man down in Florida, drunk driving, literally drunk driving. Not just I got drunk and then I went and drove. Literally had the bottle in the car with her. Weed in her system, not that I care about that, but, you know, doesn't help her cause either. And just crashes. She already ran through a red light. She was driving like, she, she, she almost killed two people on her way to killing this guy. According to the reports. And then she killed this guy. Crashed into the back of him. He crashed into another car in front of him. And that somehow. I'm not sure if he smashed his head or broke his neck. I don't know. He's old. Fragile. Right? Doesn't matter. She killed a man. Dead. And she will have you think that. Oh, she's so sorry for this. I'm so sorry. She was literally online arguing with fucking trolls after it happened, saying that it wasn't even her fault, that he had a heart attack, and that she was barely going any fast at all, and wasn't drinking, and blah, 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 blah. Well, it's all caught up with her now, all her DUIs, all her everything else, as she was, again, as I said, sentenced to nearly 17 years in prison consecutively uh, for more on this I want to show you some clips from the actual court hearing first clip I'm gonna play you here is Tammy Sonny uh, giving her final plea she is gonna look the judge in the eye and beg 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 for me bitch beg for her freedom for some sympathy she begs to be free and to use her celebrity to teach others how bad it is check out this clip and then after that right after that we're going to check out a clip of the judge passing down the sentence Good afternoon, Your Honor. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been bad on a little bit of a call this week. I lost my voice. When I was 16 years old, I decided to apply to college and study biology and pre-med because I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to help people through their pain and suffering, but more importantly, I wanted to heal people. The first line of the Hippocratic Oath reads, I will do no harm. On March 25th, 2022, I did the opposite of that. I did harm to someone else, and my entire being was crushed. My career path took a different course than medical, 
but my morals, values, and ethics have always remained the same. And I've had time to consider things like some of the good that came from my career. Through my time in the industry, I was able to help people from one end of the spectrum to the other. I entertained and brought happiness to some people's lives. Once I was able to help a stranger who was having a seizure at one of my appearances at a convention. <laughs> and I've made terminally ill children's wishes come through to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. I have done something horrible, but I am so much more than the worst that I have done. I try to think about the good I've done. Because when I sit along thinking about what I did to the Lasser family that tragic day, from a stupid decision, I feel the regret and remorse deep inside my soul. I know that they don't get to rest knowing he's gone. Because when I was 20, I lost my father as well to heart disease. And just last August, my 87-year-old mother passed away while I've been incarcerated. I never got to say goodbye to her, just as they didn't get to say goodbye to their beloved family member. I know how it feels, how it hurts, how it tears her heart out. And for that, I'm truly, truly sorry. I know my, my words are not enough, but please know that I think about you every day. Every second of every day. And I know I will do whatever I can to make the changes I need to make sure this never happens again. No one should have to go through this. And please know that every single second of every day since the crash, I have wished I could share places with you. I try to think back to what caused my downfall. And I think it started with the death of my fiance, Chris, in 2005. He was tragically taken from this world, and I hated myself for not being able to change things for him, to heal him and care for him, and keep him safe. But what followed was a huge trend of mistakes that I should have learned from. I should have learned, but I couldn't connect my mind to my heart to do the right thing. There are many things in my life that I wish I would have done differently. But they say everything happens for a reason. I refuse to go backward and make the same mistakes again. Because the pain I feel in my heart for what happened is indescribable. It haunts me daily and each night in my nightmares. But the only way to fix it is to truly change my path. If I could turn back time, I would. If I could find a way to change the events that happened that day, I would in a heartbeat. If I could bring Mr. Lasker back and take his place, I would in an instant. I feel that if I was given the chance to change, to redeem myself, and if I used my resources, my personal experiences, my history, and a little bit of the fame that I garnered a long time ago, I can be a true asset to the community by helping to educate our youth and adults about the dangers of drinking and driving, the dangers of not having your mental illness properly treated, and the catastrophic events that can result from it. A precious life was lost that tragic day, and I'm so incredibly sorry for that. I would ask that you give me the opportunity to atone for what I've done and then to be released and decided to contribute to it in the most positive way possible. Thank you. Thank you. In regard to these DR manslaughter cases, they're particularly difficult in sentencing um, in criminal court. We see, of course, uh, many sensitive crimes, uh, much unnecessary pain and suffering by victims, uh, but somehow the DUI manslaughter cases seem to be the worst. Nothing that this court says or does today about can bring back Mr. Lassiter, uh, and I'm pretty certain that nothing that I say or do although I wish it could, uh, could provide some sort of comfort for the family. 
Mr. Lassiter, uh, although I'll mention, of course, every human life has infinite value. The testimony that I've heard was a very, very positive influence on people around him and tried to help people. Uh, so it's a, a, always sad to lose a human, human life, particularly one that's such a light in so many people's lives. <clears throat> This family, of course, will forever have uh, the day before this happened and then the day after. And that line in the sand of delineation for them will be a, a prominent point in their lives uh, that will be just infinitely sad. In this day and age where we have Uber and Lyft and everything else, all these other taxi services, I, I do have a difficult time sort of unwrapping why it is that we see DUI manslaughter uh, in such a reckless disregard for human life, which is what a DUI manslaughter represents. In this particular case, the defendant is requesting a downward departure. Uh, their, their burden of proof would be to show me by the preponderance of the evidence that the defendant requires specialized treatment for a mental disorder that is unrelated to substance abuse or addiction or for a physical disability and that the defendant is amenable to treatment. Um, while I credit uh, the efforts made by the defense in regard to bringing the two uh, very qualified doctors in to testify, this court has some concerns in regard to whether the preponderance of the evidence has been met. Uh, and candidly, when the court has questions in its mind, the reality is somebody has a burden of proof and questions for this court, given the long history of the substance abuse by the defendant and the overlapping symptoms of the mental illness or the substance abuse. Uh, can't say by the preponderance of the evidence that it's unrelated. The substance abuse treatment clearly began long before any uh, symptoms that they've described for me of the mental illness that they're diagnosing. In fairness, uh, Dr. Danziger met with her, I believe, one time. A Dr. Fabian met with her three times. And a lot of their information was based on her self-reporting. Uh, in addition to that, the state made the point across that um, when I'm looking at the language that requires specialized treatments, well, part of that specialized treatment was a mood stabilizer, which I think was pretty much conceded could be provided in the prison system. So I can't say by the proponents of the evidence that the, um, the grounds for the downward departure have been met. Uh, had I found that, though, I do want to go ahead and say, I'm going to answer the question of whether the court should depart. Uh, even had the court found that the downward departure was met, uh, this court can't say that this is a case uh, where it should depart. Um, the facts of this case are fairly egregious. Uh, the defendant admits to drinking vodka before driving in her kitchen while she's preparing, I guess, burritos. Uh, her blood alcohol is very, very high. Though a low level, she has some THC in her system. There's an open bottle in the front seat of the car uh, of the vodka that she's uh, drinking, apparently. She runs a red light just prior to this accident, almost causes another accident, slams into the back of this decedent, Mr. Lassiter, so hard that he hits the car in front of him. Well, he's stopping at a red light at, you know, before 8.30 p.m. in the evening. So through no far fault of his own, and I can't say that I've seen anything that Mr. Lassiter could have done to prevent this. Unfortunately, we have the death of Mr. Lassiter. In mitigation, I do have to acknowledge a few things. Uh, while I don't feel that there are grounds to downward depart, I think there was some evidence of at least some current mental health issues uh, in regard to the defendant and some serious addiction issues. Uh, she has had some tragedy in her life, although candidly many of us have, and unfortunately it doesn't really relieve the responsibility of a crime like this. The defendant in this case has entered an open plea. She's taken some responsibility for her actions, and I do credit her for that. <laughs> together something special in your home. We always find a way back home. In regard to the uh, Gabriel case, and I'm going to go ahead and cite the case for the record. It's a Supreme Court case from the state of Florida. It is cited at 314 7th, 3rd, 1243. <clears throat> it's an 
a 2021 case, as I said, out of the Supreme Court of Florida. Uh, state's arguments in their uh, memorandum of sentencing is that because that's her uh, maximum, that is also her minimum pursuant to the Gabriel case. I don't see any other way that you could read the Gabriel case, and I think, in fairness, the defense has uh, sort of acknowledged that that's pretty much um, the situation. So, in regards to counts uh, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, is that accurate? Uh, the misdemeanors pursuant to the negotiations and adjudicate the defendant guilty, sentence her to 364 days concurrent with any other uh, count in this case. Uh, with credit for the 364 days that she's already served. She's actually got more credit than that, but that's a statutory maximum. In regard to count two, driving under a suspended license, <clears throat> causing uh, death or serious bodily injury, I do note it is an aggravator that she had no valid license, and she's not only choosing to drive, but choosing to drive under the influence. Uh, pursuant to this, and state, not to be nitpicky, but I actually come up with the amount of 10.6625 would be the uh, minimum and the maximum. So just to clarify specifically uh, in calculating, I'm going to adjudicate the defendant guilty, sentence her 10.6625 years in the Department of Corrections. Her credit is 566 days, so with credit for the 566 days. On count one, the DUI manslaughter uh, Second-degree felony, I'm going to adjudicate you guilty. I'm going to sentence you consecutively to seven years in the Department of Corrections to be served after the 10.6625 um, with, again, credit for, well, she's already gotten credit, I guess, on count two, so that would already be applied. In regard to the remaining eight years, I'm going to sentence you to uh, follow by eight years of probation, the conditions of which are following. There is a four-year minimum mandatory to count one, so uh, the first four years of that term will be a minimum mandatory sentence. Conditions will be standard conditions of probation, plus she must have a substance abuse evaluation with any follow-up treatment. She must have the alcohol safety education course. If that overlaps with the substance abuse evaluation, of course, there would only be one required. Victim awareness program, 50, 000, sorry, 50 community service hours, $10,000 fine, and her driver's license will be permanently revoked. Otherwise, any standard fines and costs. Uh, state is not requesting cost of prosecution, cost of investigation, so I'll not be applying them. All right, does that cover everything? State? And I'll no information. All right. Any questions, Ms. Sitch? All right. You have 30 days to appeal. That must be in writing with the clerk of court. If you cannot afford counsel to appoint counsel to represent you. I gotta hand it to her. I almost felt bad for her. Almost. I was this close to feeling bad for her. It's a sad story. It was a good sob. Look, if you're gonna run a sob story by the judge, it's a pretty goddamn good one, right? Mental health issues. Ah, my back, ah, my neck, ah, my traumatic head injury from all of my in-ring bumps that I took. I'm sure she was just battered around so much and concussed all the time that she has permanent CTE. Now, I don't know for sure. Maybe she did. Fuck, I wasn't a wrestler either, and I got my head bashed off the fucking canvas on a leg drop. I got leg dropped, and my head hurt all goddamn night long. Because I tried to... I, Sure, I had my head turned and I looked up and it's taking too long. And I looked up like, where is he? Boom, on my head. Ow. Okay. But it is what it is. Wrestling shit happens. She tried to blame it on her husband. Oh, my husband died. Oh, his tragic passing made me so depressed. Okay. Wasn't that long after you were... You know, fucking every guy you could get a get gets dick inside of you in the locker room while Chris was putting his boots on. I'll be right back, Chris. I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Runs over to fucking anybody's locker room and fucking just takes the dick in a broom closet somewhere. Comes back. 
Okay, Chris, I'm ready to go. You ready to go? Let's go out here and kill it tonight. Yay! What about her getting fired from a from ECW? Fired from ECW, not WWE CW either. Fired from Paul Heyman's Bingo Hall ECW for her drug problems. How fucked up do you got to be to get fired from ECW for drug problems? They're literally fucking snorting coke, smoking weed, and fucking injecting each other in the locker rooms. It's been reported by multiple wrestlers. Popping pills, open pill sales. Ah! You can't tell me that it was this fucking... How bad do you got to be? You got to be completely... Like, you got to be completely worthless as a talent at that point. You know, not showing up, not doing what you're told, being a problem. All of this before Chris died. Then Chris died. Now when... She did fuck Dolph Ziggler somewhere in there, so that's cool. But she also got a bajillion DUIs. And look, I'm not trying to bury her either. I mean, I am, clearly, obviously. (laughs) But I get that one thing leads to another and people eventually find themselves down a road that they never meant to go down in life. You know, part of her sob story, I wanted to be a doctor and help people. There was one time I helped a fan at a meet and greet. Good for her. I'm glad. And that's true. She was a medical student. She was a smart motherfucker, too. She was a young, pretty, <clears throat> smart college student. She had the whole world ahead of her. And she got brought into this crazy world that's called wrestling. And that's not an excuse because, you know, The Undertaker didn't kill anybody that we know of. I mean, on TV, he's killed lots of people. Paul Bearer. Other people, I'm sure, I don't remember off the top of my head, but he does that from time to time. He's the Undertaker. But you don't see him out just killing people in real life. Right? Stone Cold Steve Austin, been in the business his whole life. Does he go out and kill people? No. He doesn't do that. Sonny does. Sonny does. The judge threw the book at her. Now, she was facing up to 24. Four years. So the judge did not give her everything that she could. And she actually got more for the DUI on a suspended license than she did for killing the guy. She got 10 for the the driving the fucking car and then seven for murdering a guy by accident. Why I don't believe her and don't feel bad for her really boils down to... Her arguing with fans online after this happened and trying to defend herself. She is all about herself. That's who she cares about. All she's worried about is herself. That entire sob story. I've seen it a million times, my friends. Girls will cry and lie to get their way out of, oh, you know, some cheating ass bitch. I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. I didn't mean to. I just slipped and accidentally fell on his dick. Oh, they're sorry, all right. So fucking sorry, Uh uh-huh. Just sorry enough to try to stay out of jail. That's what you were, Sonny, in my opinion. I think she got a fair sentence. I don't know that she should have got the full 24. Maybe. Some people say that she should have. Look, I'm not even a big fan of prison sentences, to be honest. Prison scares the fuck out of me. Man, spending the rest of your life in a fucking box, a number in the system as part of a government, and even when you get out, your life's over. What are you going to do when you get out? Nothing. Nobody's going to want to have you around. You're a felon. You've spent your fucking 20 years in prison. Nobody cares. She will not be eligible until she's hit 85% of her sentence, which I am not a mathematician. I am a journalist, I am a writer, not a math guy, but 85% of 17 years, it's got to be 
what, 15 years, right? 14, 14 and a half, maybe? She's going to be gone for a long, long time. We are, we have heard the last of Sunny, I think. Unless she ends up on some sort of documentary or, you know, maybe she starts. You know, you can write chicks in prison. I've looked into this. Don't ask why. There's some hot chicks. In, I mean, maybe they murdered a person or two, but look. Casey Anthony, I'd still smash, right? Jody Arias, I'd still smash, right? So, Sonny. But Sonny, ah, I wouldn't smash Sonny. But maybe I would, just to say. Why are we even talking about this? We're way off topic here. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. But what do you guys think? Jesus Christ. I'm going to just admonish myself for that one. I apologize for that. The show is not about my pervy fantasies. You don't tune in to hear about which WWF divas I want to have relations with. You come here to hear about the stories. And the story was Tammy Sitch sentenced to 17 years, 16 and change, 15 maybe, because she's already had uh, like 500 some uh, days time served. So about a year and a third, year and a half ish. She's already served. So I want to know all your thoughts about it. Let's have a conversation about Sonny down in the comments below. If you want to just be that guy like I just was and talk about how hot she used to be, go for it. I ain't going to shame you. If you'd still smash now, even though she looks the way she does, go ahead. I ain't going to shame you. If you're going to bitch at me about having why I'm talking like this, about smashing people, fuck you. Put that down in the comments below. But also, I really do want to know your thoughts. Do you think Sunny should have gotten more? Do you think she should have gotten less? Did you buy her sob story? Or do you think it was just that? A sob story for a junkie and a troublemaker trying to keep herself out of more trouble. I want to hear your thoughts. It is sad, though. Ultimately, the whole thing's sad. It's sad for the wrestling industry. Just because we never want to see one of our own out there making those kind of headlines. And, uh, you know, if there ever was a case for quietly removing someone from the WWE Hall of Fame, Sonny might be one of those people. And, uh, I mean, she did kill. She is the third. Was she the third WWE wrestler to kill somebody? No, there's got to be more than that, right? Pretty sure Steve Blackman's killed some people. I digress. This one's off the rails, folks, but I had fun with it. Peace, love, and pizza. Hit that subscribe button down below. We'll catch you in the next video. I hate juggalos. I fucking hate them. I say all this with a grain of salt because for a good part of my own life, I proudly identified as a juggalo. You should come to the gathering with me. Nah, man. I'm, I'm not into all that whoop whoop shit anymore. I'll pay for your ticket. I got fired today. Get the fuck out. Still got room for me? Spike, slow the fuck down. Cops. Fuck your sleep. Fuck your sleep. Fuck your sleep. The savages started closing in with their tiki torches and war paint. Shit. Run. You guys got a dead body here already? Even the aliens were throwing shade. It was pure panic and intense horror. There was a guy I saw got chopped in half. I had nothing left to go back to. You alive? <sighs> yep. The Gathering. A bold journey into the belly of the Juggalo underworld. Well, the good doctor, Dr. Britt Baker, D.M.D., has been a fixture in AEW since AEW was founded. She was literally the first female signing to the company. She might have been the first actual signing to the company, even. Uh, I don't know if she came before Jericho or not. Uh, certainly the EVPs are on different contracts. But she has been a day one star. The face of the women's division, if you will. And even though time has passed and things have moved on... Tony, Tony Storm's doing a great job now in the women's division. Britt Baker seems to have been kind of left behind. We haven't seen a lot of her. 
And, of course, the first person to notice this would be the good doctor herself, Dr. Britt Baker, as she posted on her Twitter account. And this has gotten a lot of people stirred up here. Now, let's go ahead and pop on over and take a look and see what she has. I have it queued up here. Dr. Britt Baker, she posted this during AEW Dynamite. So this is while Dynamite was on the air. And she report, she posts tonight's AEW Dynamite MJF live promo time seven whole minutes, which is actually a hell of a lot of promo time. Christian Cage live promo time ten minutes, which is uh, even more. All of 2023 AEW Dynamite Britt Baker live promo time zero. <sighs> So this has a lot of people stirred up. We need to get you back on the mic and in the ring, fans say. Tony Khan just dropping the ball, someone else says. Uh, But these marks under the comment section here were not the only people who had concern about this tweet from Dr. Britt Baker. As her good buddy over at Busted Open Radio, Mr. Dave LaGreca, And, of course, Tommy Dreamer was there with him as well. Did a whole 45-minute fucking segment discussing this very topic, the underutilization of Britt Baker. And should she have tweeted this during Dynamite Live? Well, I'm going to play you the clip, and then I'm going to give you my thoughts because I have thoughts. Check out this clip. At this point, it almost has a million likes to it. So, Tommy, what do you think and what's your take on this tweet from Britt Baker that she sent out right before the end of Dynamite last night? I'm actually surprised that she has not had a microphone in 2023. First of all, that's shocking. Like When I first heard that, I was like, that cannot be true. So I'm going to take her for a word, but it it sounds almost unbelievable that Dr. Britt Baker did not have a live microphone in her hand in all of 2023. Because she's an excellent talker and she's got the peeps behind her when she does her DMD. Um, Backstage interviews, I know she's had those. So that does count. Maybe they were on other shows. Anyway, if uh, I guess to address her tweet in the era of social media it is a thing you can air your gripes publicly and then you have to deal with it internally as a company or like if this is a talent relations issue we've seen it with certain talents um in both companies if i could relate to something that happened that I was a part of that involved Tony Khan when he had a player from the Jaguars that was unhappy and tweeted it. And two or three days later, he was traded. Wrestling is twofold. If that is, then there has to be some ramifications towards her. With it's either, okay, you did this during the show. It actually started trending. How does this make the show look good? How does this make the company that you're a flag bearer for look good? Um, or let's take it this way. I understand, you know, you're, you're not on television, but you were in a group. A lot of your group members got hurt. Um, we had a reposition, blah, blah, blah. There's different ways to go about it. If you were just talking about this particular show, I would say, well, where were Kenny Omega, Don Callis, the Young Bucks, all these, they weren't on my show and had no mic time either. Jericho, another great example. Um, But when I go 2024, I mean, 2023, I say, hmm, or the other part of our industry, she could be the devil. Nailed it. Hit the nail on the head with the hammer. Tommy Dreamer gets the prize, wins the trophy. Tommy Dreamer nailed it. Britt Baker is the devil. That is what I suspect. 
Dave LaGreca's out here doing a 45-minute goddamn fucking segment on Busted Open about how Britt Baker was underutilized and they're dropping the ball with her and Tommy Dreamer's sitting there saying if she should, you know, if this is true and this is how she feels, she needs to be fined or she needs to be sent packing, given her release. Ah, chill the fuck out, everybody on the internet. Oh my God, Tony's dropping the ball. <laughs> she's the devil. That's why she's doing it. That's why she tweeted it during the show. Because it's part of the fucking show. She is the person under the mask. Thank you. And it has something to do with Adam Cole, I'm sure. And it's going to be a big old spot, a big huge role for Britt Baker. You cannot convince me. And if it is, if this is true... This is legit, and Tony Khan just can't see it in in a fine time on his fucking busy schedule to put Britt Baker on any one of his three shows. He's insane. <clears throat> is she the best wrestler in the world? No, but she's a star. She's a big-time star, as a matter of fact, and she can talk like nobody's business. Give this woman a microphone all day long. And she's had a microphone in her hand since day one. I cannot find it in myself to believe that Tony Khan just forgot about Britt Baker. She's one of his top guys, top girls, gals, people, whatever. Period. One of her top people in the women's division, but I would argue one of his top people in the entire company. Britt Baker is a foundational pillar of AEW. I don't give a fuck with the four pillars t-shirt promo angle with MJF four-way. Ah, Britt Baker needs to be on that list because replace Sammy Guevara with Britt Baker because Sammy ain't done a goddamn thing in a long, long time. Britt Baker, this AEW is the house that Britt Baker built in a lot of ways. You can't tell me that she has not been one of the most prominently featured people on the in the entire history of AEW since day one. And for good reason, because she deserves it, because she's the shit, because she's talented as all hell. So if this is true, and Tony's just like, you know what, I just, you know, ain't get, creative ain't got nothing for you currently. Sitting catering, the food's real good. We'll call you when we got something. Britt Baker. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. If it's true, it's booking malpractice. And Tony's been accused of booking malpractice several times in his life before. So uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility. I'm not saying that that this isn't legit. But I'm saying that she's the devil and it's not legit. Because I just... If it's true... Tony Khan needs the book, the pencil taken away from him uh, right now. Spank him, take his birthday away, take the company away from him. He should not be allowed to have the book anymore. I think Britt Baker was, she was doing this whole outcast angle, and the outcast angle took a big fat shit in the middle of the ring because Ruby wasn't getting over, Paige wasn't getting over, fucking uh, Jamie Hayter got hurt. <clears throat> and that left Britt out there standing in the middle of the ring holding her balls. What's she going to do? Work with Paige? Nobody cares. She's going to work with Ruby? Nobody cares. And Tony became a, her own, own fucking Tony Storm, that is, because there's so many Tonys in AEW. Tony Storm broke off and did her complete whole other thing and became her whole other person. At which time, I think the decision was made... To pull the trigger on taking the belt off of Soraya and nixing the whole outcast's angle or greatly downplaying it. <clears throat> with Jamie Hayter out injured, what do you do with Britt at that point? Whatever was in the plans for Britt was thrown up in the air, up in smoke. Who's she going to work with? I mean, you could book her into any kind of match, honestly. You know, you could throw her right in the mix. Get her out there with any, literally anybody because she's a draw. And because people will watch her on TV. Which is why I think the idea came up to move her into the role of the devil. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. 
tell me in the comments that I'm a dumbass and that AEW just sucks and Britt Baker's being uh, massively underutilized. Now, one of the other topics of conversation that was on the Busted Open uh, show when they were talking about this was that Britt is hurting AEW by saying this, especially going public with this and doing it during the show. I think the fact that it's during the show makes it a dead giveaway. I think the thing is that the devil is going to ha- be somebody that has grievances with MJF and Tony Khan and anybody else. And it's probably Britt Baker. And it will be a huge push for her. Which will lead to probably what? A match against Tony Storm at some point, I would imagine, right? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But what else What else would they be doing then? So I've already laid out the reason why Britt might be, like the rationale. If Tony's thinking, why, why would Britt not be on TV? Eh, because she's, you know, because her whole angle was thrown into fucking, it was, became a debacle. Tony got over and became something else. Jamie got hurt. Soraya never got over. Time to move on to something else. That could just be it. But I think that something else is that Britt Baker is the devil. And I don't think, I think... It's not a good look for AEW. <clears throat> Maybe they should have thought that through a little bit more. Uh, you know, because obviously people are getting the impression. Because AEW already has bad publicity. People already look at AEW like Tony Khan's a, a fucking booking joke. Like he already needs to have the pencil taken away from him and AEW is a big joke. So why wouldn't this just be another thing? If if they were like if they had a lot of goodwill with the fans right now, I don't think this would have had as bad of a reaction. But I think that's where people are coming at it from. Oh, Tony Khan just fucking up and dropping the ball more. Somebody literally put it here. Tony Khan is just dropping the ball. He sucks with booking the women's division. That's a comment that's under this post. Uh, I mean, he does, but to be fair, the women's division doesn't drop. It doesn't. If you ever read or listen to anybody break down the segment by segment ratings, the women's rating, women's segment always tanks the show every single time. Just about. There's outliers. One of those outliers is Britt Baker. I don't think Tony took her off TV. And, and, you know, just uh, on that women's division thing, it could be a chicken or the egg situation, right? Maybe nobody cares because it's not booked properly, and maybe it's not booked properly because nobody cares. You know, which one comes first? Do you just keep shoving it down people's throats till they find something that they can stick with and like? Or do you just go, hey, every time I put a women's match on TV, the ratings just fucking die. So how about I put less of those on TV? Or you double down and you try harder. You try it either way, see which one sticks first, I guess. But to wrap all this up here, and I'm very curious to hear your comments down uh, in the comments. Your comments in the comments. Your thoughts in the comments. I want to know what you guys think. Is Tony Khan just fucking this up? Is he dropping the ball? Or is Britt Baker the devil? I think she's the devil. I think it's booking malpractice for Britt Baker to just be hanging out and catering to the point where she's out on Twitter fucking tweeting about it during Dynamite. I think it leads to something. I think that's what they're setting up. I think her angle is going to be her anger, frustrations, and being disgruntled. And, you know, that's going to be her reasoning for being the devil and wanting and tied to Adam Cole because Adam Cole's besties with MJF. That's my guess. And look, other people have speculated it too. You heard Tommy Dreamer say it. You've heard that on the internet as well. A lot of people speculating that. Um, But clearly, when you go through the comments of this tweet over here, people uh, (laughs) people are pretty upset about it still. And they think that this is just yet another failure by AEW. I'm curious your thoughts. Either way, what do you think? Leave them in the comments below. Peace, love, and pizza. 
And oh, by the way, if Britt Baker is not the devil, if the devil's mask is revealed and it's not Britt Baker, I'm going to find something to do. I will do a public apology to Britt Baker on this show. I will, I will write a hundred times. I'm sorry. I'll figure something out. We'll figure it out. But, uh, I'm going to hold myself accountable to that because I don't always go out on a limb here and we don't always talk wrestling here. You know, you don't hear me talking about the angles and the booking and the speculation. We cover podcasts here. Thankfully for me, there was a podcast talking about this situation. So, yeah, gets my foot in the door. So that's what it is. Uh, But hold me accountable. Like I said, I don't often go out on a limb, but uh, I'm going out on a limb on this one. She's the devil. But if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I will atone for that. Catch you in the next video. So I had saw this story making the rounds about a Ric Flair promo along with Sting that was taped for Rampage. And apparently at the Rampage tapings, Ric Flair was in the ring doing a promo with his good old buddy Sting and uh, did the whole... You know, I'm staying at the fucking Marriott, women, no husbands, no boyfriends, that whole gimmick. And apparently this pissed a lot of people off on the internet, because of course it did. Why wouldn't it? Everybody's offended by everything. Everybody's looking for a reason to be offended. Not because they're actually offended, but because they're looking for a reason to be offended on Twitter so that they can gain gain fucking attention or virtue signal points or whatever the case may be, right? So Ric Flair has this history of being a dirty old man and possibly doing some shady shit, right? So I do see why this particular guy's comments in that direction would stand out, but this is his shtick he's been doing since... 80s get over it but you know i was gonna look past it you know i saw that and i was just eh, who cares but as i had uh twitter up here for another segment that i recorded i came across this here tweet and now this makes uh this story i think worth giving more attention to check this out here over at twitter over at x if you will X won't even say my own name when I come around. X, stay on top, but remain from the underground to the Z. And we're all in the family. Um, Ric Flair leaves a little tweet ski here. I am so tired of hearing all this negativity. I don't need it to work. I don't need to work. And I don't need the money. Can't I simply enjoy being my dear friend Sting's side for the next few months without so much hatred? Uh, A few months you uh, signed a two-year contract, bro. I know. I'm old. But that doesn't mean I can't enjoy life. Fair point. I have earned the right to do whatever I want. Eh. And I'm exactly where I want to be. I appreciate everything at Tony Khan, but I'm more than willing to walk away if I'm embarrassing you and your company. All I can say is, I'm sorry, man. Boy, if that isn't a win for the saddest fucking tweet in the world, isn't it? I just fucking spill something on my shirt. I spilled drank on my shirt. Look at that. Look at that. Everybody see? I, spill, I got a... Spot a drink on my shirt. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We're on YouTube. Who cares, right? I don't gotta look professional or anything. Poor Ric Flair. So what if I look like a slob? Poor Ric Flair. Uh, look, man. This is oof, where to start with this because. As I had said kind of at the beginning here, I think a lot of this is just people looking for shit to be offended at. People want to find things to pick about. You can't say shit anymore. The appropriate response to that is, hey, fuck you. 
That's the appropriate. Re- oh, you didn't like what I had to say? Oh, fuck you. That's the appropriate response to that. And then they'll get offended at that. But Ric Flair, man, a victim being... Part of it's his own doing because of his shady deeds in the past. That Dark Side of the Ring episode, I think, really, really tainted the legacy of Ric Flair. I think a lot of people were unaware of that. I think it brought a lot of attention to the dirty deeds of the Nature Boy. And... um, Tainted his legacy it makes people look at him differently. So he can't just go out there and flirt with women. Plus, he's old. He's old as shit. And that's dirty, too. On the other hand, ah, age is just a number. And if he can pull young chicks, which I have heard he does, he does. Oh, he does. You might think he doesn't, but he does. People have commented that he's still flocked by beautiful women at the bar regularly. <laughs> Nation. It's Nation. So he's probably going to get a couple ladies to join him at the, some young, beautiful ladies to join him at the hotel. And all of you fans ruined it for him, damn it. I don't know. I don't know what direction to take with it because I get both sides. I can be a fence rider, can't I? I think I'm I'm a big proponent of free speech and I'm very uh I'm a warrior, I think, against cancel culture by large. I think the right answer to people being offended is instead of apologizing and trying to bend the knee and back off, I think it's fuck you. I'll do what I want. But at the same time, when you have that history that Ric Flair has, it's kind of in poor taste to be saying shit like that publicly. Now, we'll see if it makes TV as I record this. Not that I... I'm not going to sit in front like even if it was after Rampage had aired that I would have even watched it anyway because nobody watches Rampage. (laughs) Jesus. Uh, But... As I record this, it has not aired yet. So we'll see if it actually makes air that particular clip. And Ric Flair is kind of a sappy pants, too. He's kind of going around, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. If you want me to go leave, I'll leave. Fine. I'll go. He shouldn't be there to begin with. You know, a lot of this probably, too, has to do with just the hypocrisy of of Tony Khan and all the shots that he's taken at Vince McMahon and his, you know, not willing to hire Ric Flair back when Rick was supposed to come in two years ago when the Dark Side of the Ring thing aired. <clears throat> and now he just welcomes him in with open arms. Plus, Rick is there when there's 736 former WWE superstars. So that's also why people are shitting on it. I don't know, man. I don't know. Do you think Ric Flair quits? It's a sad tweet, isn't it? Isn't that sad? It's a sad tweet. Curious people are like, yeah, Nate, quit. Go home. People are fickle. People are mean. People are mean. It's hard to exist in today's internet era. You know, you got to have the ability to just tell people to piss off. You know what I mean? If you're worried about hurting people's feelings, you're going to hurt everybody's feelings because everybody's offended by everything. So it's a predicament. Uh, If I were AEW, I would just not air that segment or I would edit around it. You know, just uh, where it is that the whole in-ring promo took about 15 minutes. There's no need for an hour-long show to have 15 minutes of it be an in-ring promo with Sting and Ric Flair. So uh, they can edit that part out, I'm sure, and then uh, maybe just tell Rick to not feel like he can just say anything he wants. Maybe just kind of play it safe a little bit, you know. But I don't know, that's my two cents. Like, it didn't bother me. I'm not offended by it at all. That's Nature Boy's shtick. And even if he was a dirty pervy on an airplane, he still he's still allowed to hit on girls, is he not? Is the guy 
does the guy need to retire his dick? Maybe. Some people would say he should have it, like, chopped off. Or Wouldn't that be interesting if they did, like, cock cages or something for people that were, like, uh, com- uh, 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 acute, not, uh, uh, convicted. That's the word I'm looking for. I was going to say accused, but that ain't right. Convicted of, like, a rape or something. Like, it's, like, some high-tech fucking device that you can only pee out of and that's it. That would be fun. And only, like, the judge has the key. They like It comes off or so. It's like an ankle bracelet before your cock. That would be fun, huh? One of those for the nature boy? <clears throat> They're only allegations, too, by the way. You know, I can say, you! You watching this now, you diddled your cousin, didn't you? You did. Hey, everybody, this guy diddled his cousin. Now what? Now it's your burden to say, I didn't do I, I, I did not dizzle my cousin. And and half the people are going to think you did anyway. And thus you're ruined. And that's the era that we live in today. And that's what happened with Ric Flair. Whether he did it or not, the perception is now there and will linger with him forever. There's people that say that he should have never even been hired by AEW simply because of these allegations. Uh, I would say innocent until proven guilty to an extent, but I also think where there's smoke, there's fire, right? You know, Rick, Triple H tells the story of Ric Flair walking around the hotel room with his just the robe, right? And the fucking a balloon tied to his gimmick. <laughs> like a helium balloon, so it like kept it afloat. That, which is actually funny. It's it, That's really brilliant. I mean, it's horribly offensive, and it's sexual harassment, and all of that stuff, right? You're basically fucking, you're, you're running around exposing yourself to people, right? But, yeah, it's nature boy. He gets a few beers in him, walks around in just a robe with a balloon. He's nature. He's nature. So I get it. I mean, but so I I am not surprised. I would not doubt by any extent that he walked up to a stewardess and was like, "Hey, baby, want to touch that thing? Huh? Look at it spinning around like a helicopter. Look, it does tricks. You want to touch it? Touch it. Come on, touch it. Whether she did or not, I don't know. But I at least buy. I at least will buy. And you gotta give them. Gotta give me that. That he was probably walking around in just the robe and nothing else. And exposing himself like a creep to everybody on the plane. Stewardesses, everybody, fucking Linda McMahon. All of them. Right? But, on the other hand, it's, it is just Ric Flair. Unless he physically forced the girl to touch it. I don't know that... You think Ric Flair might be one of the few people on the planet that could get away with walking around with a balloon tied around his cock and a robe open, wooing at people, buying them drinks. Why is he not forcing people to touch it? I mean, it's still, it, it's it's a fine line. It's sexual. It is blatantly sexual. It, it, you could get locked up if you went out and did that in any other hotel lobby or on an airplane. You can't do it, but Ric Flair probably could, at least back then, right? Maybe not now. Definitely not now. But back then, yeah, probably. And what happened from there is purely speculation and is one person's word against the other. Which, at the very least, has about, you know, has roughly half people, or you know, a large majority, a large vocal majority, I should say. Of people who, you know, think there's some smoke to that fire and that Ric Flair probably shouldn't even be on TV, let alone inviting women up to his dirty old hotel room. But that's just me. I'm just, hey, look, this is, I went out and I bought this microphone here and I plugged it into this computer here and I uploaded it to the internet. And that's it. You can do the same. It's just my thoughts, just my opinions. 
I encourage you to leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments section below. Am I being way too insensitive about this? Should I be horrified that Nature Boy would even walk around with the robe exposing the, the little Nature? Should he not be on AEW TV? Should he not be able to hit on women? I would say, personally, if it was me, I would make the call to cut it. But I'm not, it doesn't bother me. I'm not going to fine him for it or like, it's not a big deal. Who cares? But apparently it is a big deal because everything's a big deal on the internet these days. Um, but it is in poor taste at the very least. Let me know your thoughts. Peace, love, and pizza. Hit that subscribe button down below. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. That's it, y'all. That's all I got for you. Episode 95 in the can. Again, I want to thank everybody who helped me get to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, I'll be forever grateful for you because now I am monetized. Now I am able to take the next step on my journey with this show, uh, which is really to just be able to, uh, you know, quit the shoot job. And do this full time. Make more videos for you guys. More specialty videos and that sort of thing. I uh, wonder if you guys been checking out any of my shorts. I've been dabbling in the shorts and repurposing. Yes, yeah, some of them are clips from this show. But even there, I'm adding in new like video clips and B-roll type stuff. And uh, repurposing them into new uh, types of content and also I got a top 10 out there for the raw theme songs I'm particularly fond of that one I want to do more stuff like that uh, still in the back catalog if you haven't watched I got the Survivor Series uh, Deadly Games 2 tournament where we uh, determine the greatest Survivor Series team of all time of over 100 teams well, no we don't go through them all but there have been over 100 teams in the history of Survivor Series what team is the greatest of all time, according to your boy Seth Grimes? That is in my back catalog as well. Thank you guys, man. Thank you guys so much for supporting me, especially you guys here at the end. If anybody's hearing my voice right now and haven't turned this video off yet, it's you guys who are the biggest supporters of all. God bless you. I appreciate you so fucking much. Um, but that's it. I'll leave you guys there. I'll cut you loose. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Peace, love, and pizza. I am your boy, Seth Grimes, and this has been the Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. That one was kind of weak. We can do better than that. We'll do it next time. My voice is sore. It's kind of... <laughs>